Okay, I guess we can get started with the second session. Uh, this is the really the, uh, the fun stuff. This is where we get really technical. We get to show a lot of source code. We talk about exceptions, compiler differences, and all that stuff. So uh, we got two awesome principal engineers, Eric and Tomas, uh, who are spend their days and their nights and their weekends in the source code, and they're here taking time to talk to you. So let me bring Eric Schwiebert to, uh, to the podium, and he'll kind of take you on a dive into the cross-platform implementation. Eric. Sure. Thank you, Tony. Uh, sounds like I'm on. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Great. Good. Uh, so thank you, Tony. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Schwiebert. I'm a principal software engineer in the Office of Vision at Microsoft. My primary area is actually uh, dev tools in the Apple group. So I play with our com the compilers and linkers and the debuggers and all that fun stuff uh, that we have coming from Apple. Uh, and as part of that, I also then get to work with our folks over in the Windows side of Office, um, making sure that we're all trying to produce appropriately portable cross-platform code for that giant big block in the middle that's all the C++ engine. So I'm going to show you some cut down but specific examples of some of the technical challenges we faced over the years. As you saw earlier this afternoon, Office has been around for 30 years and has been through some pretty big changes in that time frame. We've used many compilers, targeted several different platforms, turned on the lights. <laughs> Uh, move from C to C++ to C++ 11, and all of which have presented some technical challenges for us. But before I actually get into that dive, I have a quick quiz for you. We're all using the same language, right? <laughs> Works everywhere, right? No, sorry. If it were, I wouldn't have anything to talk with you about today, and my job would be a lot more boring. So if the language isn't all the same, what is different? Why and what do we do about it? So there are a lot of things that differ in a lot of different places when we're doing software development. For Office, one of the most obvious things that differs is the operating system. We run on several flavors of Windows, two very closely related but not identical platforms from Apple. We've got server-side ASP code, browser-side JavaScript, and we're working on bringing Office to the Android platform, which uses Java in a number of places. Each of these platforms has its own preferred uh, set of APIs, development language, C or C Sharp, Java, Objective-C, and different paradigms for user interaction. Beyond that, we use different compilers, such as Visual C for, Office, or for Windows, Clang for Apple and Android development. We actually have two different versions of Clang, one provided by Apple for our Apple development and one provided by Google for the Android development. <laughs> and we've actually used GCC for a number of years on the Mac. As one more example, each of these compilers and SDKs comes with their own copy of some variant of the C++, C++ standard library. C++ 11 or 14, and various pieces of STL that are actually in the headers or actually implemented in that standard library. So let's take a look at a couple of the operating system and ABI issues that we face. One of my favorite issues is the size of WHRT. So I know it's not strictly a C++ type, but we use C++ code to manipulate Unicode data, and that involves actually using libraries from the operating system. So let's take a look at this. WHRT was originally uh, defined in 1990. It's an integral type whose values cover distinct codes for all members of the largest character set among all the supported locales. If that's not vague enough to set your spidey sense all tingly, I'm in the wrong room. If you remember from our previous session, Office started using Windows in, 19, in the mid-90s. And not only Office, but all of Windows jumped on that bandwagon. We started adding, uh, pardon me, we started adding uh, interfaces with WGR parameters to both the system and within Office itself. We have file structures in memory and on disk that store Unicode data. And so we need to be able to read and write this data from all versions of Word, running on all these various platforms with all these various compilers. One code base. Remember that integral type? Well, in, 19, or sorry, in 2003, the Unicode standard said, the width is compiler specific. It needs to be portable. You should not use it for storing Unicode text because the type is intended to be compiler defined. Oops. 
So in fact, Windows uses 16-bit WHRTs. Classic Mac, what we used before OS X, used 16-bit WHRTs. But Apple and most of the Unix systems today use a 32-bit integer type. So not only do we now have a difference between the Mac and Windows, we have a difference between modern Mac and the old Mac. But there's all these files out there with all this data, and we have to handle it. And the trick is that the C++ libraries and the STL headers have objects that use these WHRTs. std w string, std w regex, all these friends. Um, we want to use these APIs. I mean, it, we don't want to write our own regex handling. And yet, we can't call into the library if it doesn't match. So one of the nice things is that for the Unix systems, we can override, and we've chosen to override this type of WHRT to be a 16-bit entity, which dash F short WHR. It's great, means we can be compatible with the Windows side, which is where, to be honest, uh, most of Office has, has lived in the past. But if you use that flag to compile your code to assume 16-bit WHRTs, you can't call into an operating system API or the STL that was built using 32-bit WHRTs. So if you take this little example here, where you take a WHRT pointer, shove it into a W string, and you write that to the console, if you set dash F short WHR and do this on the Mac, you get absolute garbage. We'll show you one possible approach to work around this later. It's an early one, but we'll save that surprise. Size of long. Long is a long, right? No, I see a few people shaking their heads. So on Windows, all flavors of Windows, for 32-bit, 64-bit, any ARM device out there, long is four bytes. That's great. It's nice, easy to size. It's always consistent. And it is always at least smaller than your pointer type. So even on a 64-bit machine, you can put your long in a pointer, shovel it around, and you're not going to lose anything. On the Mac, for 32-bit Mac, it's still four bytes. But on a 64-bit Mac platform, the long promotes to being eight bytes. Great, it's so the same size as a pointer. You can still shove them around and pass them around. But you're now incompatible with your 32-bit system. And again, if you've written code that sticks structs in native, or sticks native longs in structs, writes them out to disk, you have to be able to handle it when you read it back in. It's also a lot of fun when you mix uh, headers from different uh, platforms, different origins. Uh, one thing may say it takes a long, but then it was defined in a different header, or 32 to 64, and you get all sorts of compiler errors. So one very simplistic, naive approach might be just ban the use of naked long, and always use some sort of explicit integer type, UN32, T, or whatever. Um, I think the C headers now have a standard size for that, but I don't know if it's true on all platforms. Um, but there are often headers that, that you may get that you can't modify. So you can play games. You can abuse the preprocessor if you'd like, pound to fine long to be uh, maybe the Win32 type, all caps, L-O-N-G. Either way, you get to play some fun and games. So we can see that even just for two relatively basic types, their size fluctuates depending on where, what world you're living in. And you have to be aware of these differences. Uh, we found that, that um, if you're not used to this, it causes a few mental hiccups when you start looking at Office code. Let's move on to some discussions around the compiler. Um, one of the fun things we get to play with is the fact that every compiler has made additions to the language. Every compiler has its own little peculiarities. Uh, some compilers, such as Visual C++, love to add their own keywords to the language. Underscore, underscore, super. It's a nice little time saver, but it only exists in Visual C++. And so if you want to port code somewhere else, <laughs> there's a patch to Clang, says Reed, so we'll look at that. But um, at the moment, if you try to port code across, uh, this is a hiccup you'll run into. Then you have things like decal spec, or attribute, or pound pragma, compiler, you know, whatever. Deco spec and attribute are interesting. They actually can provide hints not only to the compiler, but to the linker or some other component in your build chain. And none of these are language standard. But they're all necessary. 
in some way for some purpose on the native platform and compiler you're using. So you can't get around them. What do you do? We really do try to minimize their use when possible and say, if we're writing code that is really intended to be shareable, cross-platform, across all these vectors, use only the things that are in the standard. In some cases, you can, again, hide behind the preprocessor. Uh, you could pound define no return to be attribute no return or decal spec no return, depending on whether you're using Clang or Visual Studio. Uh, the C++ standard bracket bracket attributes are also great, but they're not supported everywhere yet, so be careful. Um, the big fun one for us has been exception specifications. This is one that we've poked at for a number of years. It's an interesting idea that turned out to be quite complicated in practice. Uh, when we first moved to, C++, to modern C++ in the mid-2000s, we drank the Kool-Aid. We really did. Uh, we put throw paren paren on everything. At least we didn't put throw of concrete types on everything, um, but we have decorators to say that this code throws or this code doesn't throw all over the place. Um, these were deprecated in C++ 11. We just moved to no accept, but again, Visual Studio doesn't yet support the no accept keyword, so you have to play some games again. Um, I love these two quotes about exception specifications. They kind of capture the essence of the complexities of working with them. Uh, Herb Sutter said in 2007, I think in response to a Dr. Dobbs article, that people love exception specifications until they discover that violating one means invoking terminate, which is almost never what you actually want. And if you go look at the Boost documentation, they say that the biggest problem with exception specifications is that programmers use them as though they have the effect a programmer would like instead of the effect that they actually have. So the fun thing here is not all compilers actually invoke terminate, like the spec says. So let's have a conversation with our compilers. Uh, we have a simple function that is decorated to say, I don't throw. And if you ask Visual C++ what it's going to do, it will say, I trust you, developer. You told me you don't throw, so I won't. I'm not even going to check to see if you throw. Your code's going to run really, really, really fast. But if you throw, all bets are off. Who knows what's going to happen? You might crash, because you know, maybe you're going to end up in a catch block that you wrote somewhere up in your event handling loop or whatever. On at least some of the older Unix compilers, we had the opposite. You said, I don't throw, and the compiler says, all right, but I don't trust you. I'm going to make sure you don't throw. I'm going to look for and check every place you call a function that says it won't throw. And you're going to run pretty slowly, because I've got to check all these exceptions. And if you throw, I'm just going to cut you off the knees. You're dead, you're terminated, you're unexpected, move on with life. And that result to the user is, well, you either might crash or you will crash. It sounds the same to the user. And you might run fast, you might run slow, we don't really know. So we've tried to just avoid these altogether. Um, I like the idea of no accept because you're not required to do all the performance implications. You'll still get terminated, but it's deterministic. But again, we don't have no accept in Visual Studio yet. So we have abused the preprocessor yet again uh, to hide the throw paren paren behind a, a pound define. Um, nice advantage of this is eventually when we get full no accept support everywhere, it can be consistent across our platforms. We have one macro to change and a lot of testing to do, but we don't have to go edit hundreds of thousands of lines of code to change every prototype on the planet. Couple last notes on exceptions and portability, portable code. The Visual C++ uh, STL has two non-standard constructors for exceptions. They're a nice little convenience for giving a custom error string to you, to you the developer, um, but I'd rather have each type of exception actually be its own concrete type and override what to, again, return the custom error string that you want. And lastly, structured exceptions only exist on the Windows side. They require some runtime support, and we don't have it on other platforms, so we've really pushed people into use standard C++ exceptions. I'd like to also talk about two-phase name resolution. Um, 
There's a lovely blog post uh, the LVM team put up a couple years ago that has a, a great example of this uh, and how it works in Clang. But, and some of, some of the examples I'm going to show here may be rather trivial for you, the expert C++ crowd, but remember, because Visual Studio doesn't do two-phase name resolution, when you're working at a company like Microsoft where that's our predominant compiler, this matters. There are three common cases that we see here. Two of them are simply needing the right syntactic sugar in the right place, adding the type name or the template keyword to tell the compiler, hey, really, this is a type name or this is a template reference, go find the function over there. The last one is the one that we see over and over again when porting code. It's probably actually the simplest one to fix. The other two are less common and the error messages you get are almost inscrutable. So uh, that's why I dive into this one instead. And it's simply the, the lack of a name qualifier for dependent base name lookup. So let's give them a quick example here. We have a simple class base, it's templated, has a function foo, takes a T and does something with it. And we have a class that depends on it and invokes foo when you do something. And then we'll give it an actual concrete instantiation so that we know we have to use the code. If you compile this code with Visual Studio 2014, it compiles just fine. No problems at all. If you compile it with Clang or GCC, however, you get an error. I don't actually have GCC's error text handy because on the Mac side we dropped GCC a few years ago. But this is what you see in Clang. Clang says, foo is an undeclared identifier. I don't know what you're talking about. Clang is helpful and it actually looks a little farther and says, you know, actually I did find a thing called foo. If you want me to use it, you have to qualify the identifier. And it helpfully points out that if you put this arrow in the right place, I'll do what you mean. So what they mean is to take this code and turn it into this code. Now, yes, this is a really trivial, simple example, but we see this all the time, where a developer who's very used to the behavior in one particular compiler, because that's what they're writing in, what they're delivering software in every day, doesn't compile for another platform. And we are really striving toward having that yeah, I don't think we'll ever get to 100%, but we want those numbers as high in the 98s, 99s for shareable code, where the code can be shared. And so we want to catch these sort of errors early and make sure that our developers write the code that is portable. Um, many developers, particularly again if they're used to one particular compiler, one particular set, set of behaviors, are not aware of the difference between uh, definition and instantiation time, or dependent and non-dependent names. And we have found that enforcing that correctness is a problem when your predominant compiler doesn't enforce it for you. So if you are trying to write code to be portable in multiple platforms, multiple environments, the earlier you run your code through multiple compilers, the more likely you are to have code that is compliant, parses everywhere, runs everywhere. So a couple Quick takeaways. Each of the, at least for us at Microsoft, each of the commonly used compilers in our world has a slightly different set of C++. And each platform has its own rules, the ABIs and the intrinsic types that we use. So we are pushing people to use explicitly sized entities to be very explicit about the code and data, and to use multiple compilers to make sure that their code is as completely portable as we can make it. With that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Tomash. He's going to show you some lovely examples of mixing C++ and Objective-C in the iOS and Apple world. Thank you. Now, let me give you this. First, I'll turn it off. Hello, uh, my name is Tomasz Kukielka and I work at uh, Microsoft Office for Apple platforms. Um, 
uh, our division is called Apex, uh, Apple Platform uh, Productivity Experiences, formerly known as uh, Mac Business Unit. That's probably what most people are familiar with. But once we started working secretly on, uh, on the iPad, we decided to change the name of the division to reflect that we are no, no longer on the Mac only, but also for uh, other Apple platforms. Uh, I would like to uh, share, you, uh, share with you some approaches that we are uh, taking to deal with the uh, problems described by my colleagues. Um, first, uh, I would like to, uh, to tell you how C++ cross-platform code that we share with Windows interacts with uh, Apple's platform-specific Objective-C. Then I would like to tell you about uh, what problems you may see when you start mixing headers from different platforms. And uh, finally, I would like to tell you what the 16-bit 16, 16 versus 32-bit mismatch of the uh, white character, uh, what, what it forces us to do. Okay, the, the approaches that we are taking may not be good for everyone. Okay, if you have smaller code base without such long history and uh, bias toward one platform, you may choose to do something else. Okay, we live in a world where Windows Office division is 10, 10 times bigger than Apex division. And it, in terms of uh, people and in terms of the code. We are trying, me and Eric are working in foundations team at Apex, we are trying to get as, pull all the tricks that we have to get the shared code identical on both platforms. So let's start with uh, uh, C++ and Objective-C. So as, as we mentioned many times before, uh, Office is C++ code. But the OS that we are interacting with is uh, actually Objective-C. So that interaction happens on two levels. On the lowest level, uh, we implement some of the PAL APIs in terms of Objective-C. And on the higher level, in UI code, UI code is written in Objective-C, but we need to connect and hook it up to, to shared logic written in C++. So we are taking the advantage of the fact that uh, both Objective-C and C++ are based on, the, on plain C. So it's, it's kind of natural common uh, denominator. Okay. So we actually have two options. We can uh, write C wrappers around C++, and I will show you, uh, show you an example of that. Or we can use the Objective C++ feature uh, provided by Clay. Let's start with uh, uh, wrapping C++ code in, uh, in, in C. Uh, I have a simple class, CPP object. I shield uh, plain C code uh, using the if dev C++. Uh, I have only one uh, meaningful method uh, called do something. Uh, next, in order to expose this object uh, as a plain C, I'm, I'm type defing it. I'm creating a CPP object graph uh, that I'm going to use as a reference to, uh, to this class object. And finally, we have the wrapper functions, which operate on that uh, type of. OK, it's simple. Uh, create, uh, delete, and do something. Now, let's take a look at the uh, implementation. It's simple. It's straightforward. Uh, create function uh, invokes operator new. Notice I use the no throw. Uh, and I assume that CPP object here, uh, the constructor will not throw, uh, which may not be true in general case. Uh, 
Second, uh, delete. Just straightforward. Uh, on the other hand, delete uh, or this, the distractor of the class should never throw, so this should be safe. And lastly, we have do something, which uh, just forwards uh, uh, the invocation to, uh, to do something uh, method in the C++ object. And at this point, I would like to assume that do something method really can throw. So what we need to do when we're writing such wrappers, we of course need to uh, put a try catch block for uh, exception safety. Usage is simple. Very straightforward, nothing Objective-C uh, specific. Uh, it's just as something that you would do in plain C. Uh, you create such object, you invoke the, the do something, and you delete that object. Uh, and that's one approach. It's, uh, uh, it's perfectly acceptable. We use it. It's, uh, and, and I believe that it's industry, and when, when you expose a C API and it's implemented in C++, that's what you do. Uh, the downside, it's a tedious task to create that, uh, such wrappers, right? Uh, especially for rich C++ classes, uh, and it's usually done manually. So Clang offers support for Objective C++. Now, that's great. Uh, Let's do it. Let's make, let's make some uh, C++ and Objective C. Well, you do it. It seems to work well until there's a code police at Microsoft that comes and stops you. Okay, we think it's reckless driving. Okay, uh, what do you say when the police stops you? Is there a problem, officer? And Indeed, there is a problem. We don't like to, uh, to mix uh, Objective-C and C++, mainly because of the, of the exception safety. I will show uh, an example in a moment. Another uh, problem is that C++, when you put C++ code in, in Objective-C header, the, uh, this, it is viral. It, uh, it contaminates the header. Every other Objective-C code that includes that header also needs to be uh, C++ or Objective-C++. And uh, we prefer to, to keep, keep a clean separation. Let me show you uh, examples. Now, the third reason why we don't like to do it is that our C++ code that we shared with Office really requires Windows SDK headers. And that introduces yet another set of problems, issues, and headaches. And I will, I will talk about this later as well. So uh, I would like to take a first start talking about exception safety. And there are great sessions by uh, John Kaup uh, uh, happening uh, actually parallel in this uh, to this talk. Um, I, there will be videos later that you can uh, you can watch. Uh, by the way, John Cobb worked with, uh, in Mac Mac Business Unit on uh, uh, on Outlook for Mac. Great guy. Um, we need to understand the difference between C++ and Objective C exception. Uh, the same word kind of a different uh, uh, usage. And actually, we need to understand uh, how C++, uh, Objective-C exceptions are used in uh, Apple's Cocoa framework. And they are more exceptional than C++. What do we uh, understand by that? Most exceptions in Cocoa indicate a programmer error or a, some kind of catastrophic error. For that reason, uh, Cocoa frameworks are not even uh, exception safe. Uh, they do not clean up properly. You can expect memory leaks uh, and unexpected behavior. The, 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 the software may be, the program may be in an uh, undefined uh, state. So Apple recommends uh, 
actually terminating the process uh, when such, something like this happens, right? So on the other hand, C++ exceptions are used frequently for, uh, for error handling, and not only in catastrophic uh, situations. Uh, very often we want to recover from C++ exceptions, and good code uh, is exception safe, cleans up properly mostly by usage of smart pointers, but I will refer you to John Cobb uh, session how to do it. Now, let's take a look at the example of uh, except, uh, mix it, mixed uh, C++ and Objective-C. Uh, so we're allocating some uh, Objective-C object and a string in this case. We call some C++ code, and then we release the, uh, the object. So what happens if uh, C++ code throws? Well, of course, uh, string will not be released. Uh, it will not clean up properly. The pr uh, exception will propagate and uh, go across. Who knows how much uh, uh, Objective-C code uh, uh, in, in, in the stack. Uh, and finally, may crash if there is no uh, 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 exception handling. So we need to add try catch block. Now, this is a very simple example, right? Imagine a bigger function. Imagine a lot of code that is kind of intermixes. I will put some Objective-C, some C++, some Objective-C, some C++. This will become an unmanageable mess. Okay. Uh, also, this problem is actually not uh, Objective-C specific. If you imagine a code that started life as a plain C code and replace this Coco stuff with, a, say, malloc and free at the end, you're exactly in the same uh, situation, right? So upgrading to C++ is problematic if your code was not exception safe in the first place. So what's the solution? Should we ban Objective C++ altogether? We think that we should use it in a, in a responsible manner. So first, we want to avoid header contamination. We're not putting any C++ in the headers. So we use this uh, type def uh, C object. If we have to put some uh, member variable in a Coco class, we can put this type def object. One second. <laughs> uh, So in a similar manner, we do the other way around. When we have an Objective-C object, we can type def it to something that can be stored in a C++ object. Okay. So simple uh, uh, implementation of this would be uh, init method allocates uh, uh, the object. Again, I'm assuming C++, CPP object uh, constructor will not throw. I believe John Cobb would scold me for not putting try catch here. Um, delete, on the other hand, the alloc calls delete. Uh, and then the do something method, of course, needs a, a try catch. <coughs> now, why this is acceptable? We think that the simplicity of, of the wrapper like this uh, let's you focus on technicalities. Like, you can remember to put the try-catch block and all the stuff that you need to do. Uh, practically, you know, there's no logic in here. There's no real logic. Because when you write a code, you want it to do something. There might be some complex logic. You, you, you're thinking about how this code flow will go and how, uh, how you want it to make it work, and you forget about this, that type of stuff. It's so simple that you can even you know, be code generated, or at least start as something that is, uh, is generated, and then you massage it by hand. Okay? Now, to the question, Objective-C 2.0 runtime allows you to use private member variables. Okay? We need to remember that Objective-C 2.0 runtime is on 64-bit Mac or on iOS. If you're on 32-bit Mac, uh, like, unfortunately, we are still on, uh, in Mac Office, you cannot uh, use. So how do you use, uh, take advantage of this? Uh, 
when you have a private uh, member variable, you don't have to put it in a header. You can uh, move it to the implementation file, and your header becomes cleaner. Okay. So here's the example. Uh, we have a private uh, CPP object as a member variable. Notice I'm using another feature of Objective C++ that I'm putting the object itself, not a reference like previously, uh, to a pointer allocated by new or something. I'm putting the object itself in the uh, uh, Objective C code. Uh, the way it works, that the, uh, the compiler will generate code to invoke the default constructor before init and invokes the destructor after dialog. Uh, it's great for smart pointers, as you may, uh, uh, you may imagine. Right? And uh, if you paid attention, you know I missed something here. Yep, we can't do without that. Okay, I hope you, uh, uh, you remember this recurring mantra whenever you are mixing the languages, uh, of especially C++ with other languages, you need to make sure that uh, you ensure uh, uh, exception safety. That's true with any language, though, right? Yes. Uh, well, I'm working on Apple platforms, so my experience is mostly on that. But there are similar approaches that everybody needs to take for, for different. And in fact, many of those things that I'm going to, uh, uh, or I showed you already, I used uh, or directly taken from us when the Android for, uh, for uh, Office for Android started. They took some of those uh, tricks from, from us because we already had some established experience with, with this thing. Not, 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 not Objective-C++, uh, uh, but uh, some, some other things. Some developers prefer even stronger separation of C++ uh, and Objective-C. And this can be achieved using protocols. Uh, if you are not familiar with Objective-C, a protocol is like an interface. Uh, it describes class methods without uh, implementations. The terminology is confusing, right? Uh, in Objective-C, at interface is equivalent to class, right? Uh, and problem with interface will surface when we start including Windows headers. And I will show you uh, it later. So the idea about protocol is that this protocol can be in a separate header file, okay? And there's no C++ in here. Now, it, the implementation can be as dirty as you want. And it can be in both header in the, uh, and .m or that .mm file, uh, because nobody will really need to include that header. Uh, everybody will just need the protocol. Let's see uh, how, how we could use this. So the code that is calling would only need to know the protocol and the method how given object or wrapper was created. This is how we would use it. And uh, the wrapper can be passed around just by using uh, the protocol. So we achieved pure Objective-C here. C++ is the underlying implementation, but it's, uh, it's, it's clean, it's clean with, the, with the usage of protocol. Which works with the old runtime. Yes, that, that works with the old runtime very well. So as I mentioned before, a lot of shared code in Office depends on Windows SDK headers. At the same time, we use headers for, uh, from Apple for the platform on, on the Mac, on iOS. Uh, so we end up mixing the, head, the headers, the SDKs, in the same source code. I like to compare it to mixing oil and water. Okay? It's, it, it's very hard to do. Uh, the result is never satisfactory, and we still do it. Uh, why, why, do we have to, why, why do we do it? Uh, because we don't have a clean platform separation. If, you if your code is, is well factored out, 
with uh, platform agnostic types, uh, you wouldn't have to do it. But that's not the case uh, for Office. Uh, many years ago, people made the decisions to, uh, to write the code that the, the way that it is, and now we, uh, we are dealing uh, with it. Okay. We're doing refactoring, uh, trying to, to get the shared code without using the, the platform specific types. But the reality is that Mac Office and iOS Office needs Windows SDK headers. So what problems you may encounter once you do it? So SDKs might do similar things. So we, can, we see conflicting or redefined macros, and we see APIs of the same name, especially in the, uh, uh, in the old days. Now it's becoming uh, less of a problem when people are more disciplined in naming uh, APIs. Another fun thing is Pragma MS struct. Okay. Uh, what does Pragma MS struct do? This is something that we asked uh, Apple to, uh, to add for us in, uh, in GCC and uh, uh, in Visual Studio, uh, in GCC and Clang, to achieve the structure layout compatible with Visual Studio. So why do, why do we need this? Well, if you dump a structure to a file format, you want the structure to be laid out exactly the same uh, uh, in, on all platforms. Now, who would want to do this, right? Unthinkable. Well, 20, 30 years ago, the most popular file format on Earth, dot .doc, the, we call it the legacy binary format. This is all structures dumped to a file, okay? We can't afford to have any difference uh, uh, in a structure layout. That's why we are using this uh, Pragma struct. But when you're including system headers, any headers from the libraries that were not compiled with Pragma MS struct, you need to turn it off. And that's what we have to do. Another fun thing, that's what I uh, mentioned earlier. Objective-C and Windows SDK headers have some uh, clashes. First is bool, uppercase bool. Windows bool is four bytes long. Objective-C bool, one byte. <laughs> so when you, once you start doing this, you're running into a lot of issues. Another one, interface. At interface is a keyword in Objective-C. Guess what? It's in Windows headers, we have a pound defined interface to a struct. Now we combine at interface becomes at struct. It's meaningless. It, 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 uh, it causes an error. Okay. So we have to work it around as well. And we have a lot of fun with uh, white char mismatch. Imagine the shared code. When uh, on Windows, it's assumed 16, 16 bit, and we want to uh, keep it the same on the, on the Mac. But the system uh, implementations of uh, C runtime and WString assume 32 bit. And last, we have a 64 bit long problem that Eric uh, mentioned uh, different assumptions about the length of the long. And we also need to make some uh, changes in the, in the headers uh, to deal with it. Now, so how are we dealing with all these conflicts and problems? We do modify Windows headers to account for compiler and platform differences. There's no other way we could do it, okay? But we stop short of modifying Apple headers. We just don't want to do it. It would, be a, uh, it would be a maintenance issue. It would be a nightmare. So our solution that we call header interposing. We generate headers of the same name as uh, system headers, but in our location. 
then we redirect uh, the search path to include our headers. And we do some defines, undefines, pragma juggling, and we forward the inclusion to the actual header by rarely used include next. I don't know if uh, any people have ever used it. Some people might, might have heard it, but maybe never found a good use for it. So include next, what it actually does is tells the compiler to search for the header in the next search path location. Skipping the current location, searching the next. So imagine when you set up this header search path, you put your, your search path first, and the, the, the other search paths are next. So this, this is how it's going to work. Now, example, shared code on the Mac and Windows includes string. Right? On the Mac, our interposer gets included. Some extra magic needs to happen. So we have a apple headers prefix.h, apple headers suffix.h. This is, th those, those headers are, are dealing with the common problems uh, that I described uh, in the bullets uh, uh, earlier. And then we have uh, underscore string suffix.h, which uh, actually patches w string. And this brings us to the w string hack. We call it a hack because we're not proud of it, but that's uh, uh, our, our turn. So we've, we've seen, we've, we've said many times before, we use 16-bit w char in Mac and iOS Office. So the default uh, w string from STL that comes with Apple on Apple platform is not good on us, good for us. Why? It's not purely header based. There are some uh, things that are compiled into a uh, STL library and the assumption was that the character was 32 bit. Okay, so what we do, we implement our, uh, something similar to w string using uh, uh, wchar16 traits, and then we redefine wstring to be uh, our uh, implementation. Now, we would like not to do it, but uh, it's not a great solution, but short of recompiling STL library using 16-bit uh, wchars, that's the best we can do uh, today. So once we dealt with the um, uh, with W string, we have a problem with uh, C runtime APIs that are also expecting 32-bit uh, white charts. The problem is is particularly nasty because you don't see any errors at compile time or link time. It's only when you pass uh, 16 bit wide string to a function expecting 32 bit uh, wide characters and things just stop working. So we had, uh, we had multiple approaches uh, uh, to that. We, we tried to poison them, uh, just prevent usage. Okay, and then enforcing the impl implementation, let's use our own WC16 underscore prefix or WC16 namespace, uh, which would be our implementation doing the same thing, right? But if you would truly want to share the same code with Windows Office, we, we have to do better. We can't uh, force the whole Windows Office, which remember is 10 times as big as we are, and uh, to use that. So what we do? We locally override the white string APIs and we'll implement them uh, a 16-bit uh, equivalence. So C runtimes, C runtime APIs are in a, a dynamic library, 
and it can be uh, can be overridden uh, locally. And the compiler will always choose the statically linked symbol over the dynamic uh, uh, over the symbol in a dynamic library that comes uh, from the outside. And uh, it's legal. If you were wondering, there is no duplicate symbol error. Okay. And that's an uh, uh, example uh, implementation that we have. We just, we just re-implement those, uh, those functions using our own uh, replacement. That way, whenever in the Windows code there is a WCS LAN, we don't have to modify it. The linker will link with our implementation. Okay, so we're cheating here. We also use the same trick uh, to prevent the usage of, sys of system APIs that we don't have the uh, implementations for. You know, some APIs we don't need, the, and we, we find, okay, let's, let's leave us just a stop to it. Okay? We call it the link time poison pill. So our implementation, say, for wprintf, calls into some function that is not implemented. Okay, we name it appropriately so we know which one it is. Okay. So any attempt to use wprintf will result in a link error, and the linker will say, hey, uh, wprintf not implemented is not found, not implemented, right? If nobody wants to use wprintf, the function will be unused, stripped by compiler, uh, by linker, I mean, and there will be no, no link error. So the last thing is, how do we enforce that all the projects that we have link with such static library? Uh, in Office, we have lots and lots of projects. Uh, we want to make sure that all the current and future projects use 16-bit, not the 32-bit uh, uh, implementations of those APIs. So imagine somebody starts a new, uh, new project and uses w, uh, 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 CSLAN, and it links with, uh, 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 with System 1, and it, it becomes uh, unusable, right? So we want to find a way that you can't do it. So we found a way in a low-level header uh, that all projects include, we, we put a special global object uh, that every C++ file that includes it, it instantiates it. Notice deco spec select any, recently uh, supported by Clang, to prevent duplicate link errors. So even if 1,000 C++ files uh, instantiate this object, only one of them will be, will be picked. Now, what is this WCHAR CRT check object that we're going to uh, instantiate? Well, it's a very simple structure. In the constructor, I put uh, a call to a function that is implemented in my static library with overrides. So how does it work? Uh, if you don't link with my static library, you will get a link error that will say you must link statically with WCHAR CRT lib. Uh, so imagine any poor soul that stumbles upon my trap, you know, he or she will know immediately what, what needs to be done, right? So I can sleep well, avoid knowing that nobody can avoid linking with my uh, uh, static uh, uh, library. And uh, yes, I want to do it only in debug and only for C++. Uh, this, this codeless uh, is pointless to have it in ship. It's just to enforce uh, uh, proper linking with the, with the static library. So summarizing, uh, the tricks I described here allow us to keep the code as close as we can with Windows. We want to minimize if devs. We don't want any if devs for compiler platform differences. Uh, your approaches might be different, of course. 
Okay, again, smaller code base, something that can be refactored, but our millions of code are not that easy to refactor. Uh, and our division, Apex, is small. We try hard to find ways so that the shared code will not have to be changed. Uh, hopefully, maybe you will find different uses for the same techniques that I demonstrated here because your problems might be different. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's all from me. Uh, I will turn it over to Tony. That's all we have. Thank you. I'll use this. That's all we have today. I hope that was sort of helpful for you guys. Can I like uh, a quick summary? We've used C++ for decades. It has been awesome. We will continue to use it. But as you guys saw, it's not an easy, happy Cinderella story. There's a lot of challenges. And if anybody is on the C++ standard committee here, you know what all the asks are. Uh, if you guys uh, have any feedback, questions, uh, particularly if you think certain approaches that we're using can be done in a better way, please do not hesitate. Shoot us email, me, Igor, Eric, or uh, Tomas. And of course, uh, shameful attempt at recruiting. We are hiring a lot of people. We love C++ developers. The easy way for you is get on httpcareers.microsoft.com, search for product, office, Office 365, or OneNote. Uh, category software engineering development and give us your resume and let's talk uh, and with that thank you guys uh, for per, you know staying with us for a couple of hours i hope this was helpful thank you <laughs>